While I really want to maintain the focus of this course on the sentence, since that is the basic unit of writing we can most easily control and improve, I suppose it's time to openly acknowledge what has already been evident for some time in the examples I've used in previous lectures. Occasions for writing single sentences with no surrounding context are exceedingly rare. Single sentences may be in great demand if you're in the business of writing copy for a bumper sticker company, but most writing situations call for more than a sentence. Indeed, many, if not most, of the sentences we write have trouble standing alone since they contain and sometimes their effective functioning depends upon cohesive links to surrounding sentences. These links can range from pronouns whose reference appear in other sentences to extension and elaboration of similes and metaphors that appeared in earlier sentences to offering numerical or chronological references that make sense only in the context of a larger numbering system or history. Examples of this cohesion phenomenon are too numerous to mention, but my use of this cohesion phenomenon in this sentence would be a start on such an inventory of context-related, if not context-dependent, aspects of sentences. And, of course, there are logical cohesive cues, such as, on the other hand, or finally, or along these lines, that remind us that sentences, while important and sometimes magnificent in standalone isolation, are usually team players, getting help from and lending help to surrounding sentences. Indeed, M.A.K. Halliday and Rukhaya Hassan had pretty much both the first and the last word to say about the ways in which sentences velcro together in their groundbreaking and their massively authoritative 1976 study, Cohesion in English, including but also above and beyond the crude kinds of cohesion I've just mentioned, Halliday and Hassan identified five major categories of cohesive ties among sentences. 19 subcategories, and even a number of sub-subcategories. Their five primary categories for cohesion are reference, substitution, ellipsis, conjunction, and lexical reiteration and collocation. I won't try to give more than a brief indication of each, but substitution, for example, might include my own use of each, to refer to any one of the five categories I mentioned in the previous sentence. Reference includes pronouns. Conjunction covers situations such as starting a sentence with and or however. And lexical reiteration and collocation refers to using words that are closely associated due to their sharing reference to a common subject. As we might see in words all having something to do with, say, fires, flames, or burning. Cohesion in English remains the foundational work on the way sentences, on the ways sentences stick together, and it certainly rewards reading. But if you find yourself interested, but not quite that interested in this phenomenon, you might find Stephen P. Witte's and Lester Fagley's essay. Coherence, Cohesion, and Writing Quality, published in College Composition and Communication in May 1981, a more than adequate but mercifully much shorter overview of the subject. The complexities identified in cohesion in English remind us why our primary concern in this course has been with single sentences as the number of considerations that shape our writing multiply so dramatically when we move beyond the sentence to larger units of discourse that any suggestion of how to develop a sequence of sentences would be arbitrarily prescriptive, mechanical, and ultimately pretty much useless. Indeed, it would be impossible to anticipate more than a tiny fraction of the situations and purposes which would shape any sequence of sentences we might write. 
Nevertheless, it is the case that some of the syntactic features we've been working with at the level of the sentence also transcend the individual sentence to work in similar fashion in sequences of sentences. Sentences in sequence can function in paragraphs, much as cumulative modifying phrases function in the individual sentence. And sentence rhythms, particularly those associated with cumulative and balanced syntax, seem to generate clumps or clusters of sentences, all displaying those rhythms. Accordingly, this lecture will consider from several angles sentences in sequence, in clumps and clusters. Some of these clumps and clusters we call paragraphs, and that's where we will start. But the paragraph is a unit of discourse we don't actually know that much about, or at least don't much agree on what it is we do know. Furthermore, as the graph part of paragraph reminds us, there's an important visual component we should acknowledge when we write sentences in sequence. We don't speak in paragraphs, we write in paragraphs. And we know the boundaries of a paragraph, not by any prescriptive standards based on logic or syntax or sound, but by the simple fact that paragraphs are those sequences of sentences we see on the page as being set off by indentations. What we see between two indentations from the left-hand margin of the page, that's a paragraph. And we have no better definition of a paragraph that will stand up under rigorous scrutiny. And in much the same way that the graph in paragraph alerts us to the visual aspect of this writing form, we need to remember that writing is first and foremost and always itself a technological phenomenon. Whether the inscribing technology is the end of a burned stick or a pointed rock used to scratch symbols on the wall of a cave, or the most advanced computer and authoring software. We don't have time to do more than very briefly consider the likely impact of technology on our sentences, whether alone or in sequence. But this lecture will conclude with a few remarks about what is now being called electronic textuality or multimedia writing. But now back to the concept of the paragraph, the unit of organization most of us see as the next structure our sentences combine to build on their way to becoming much larger units of discourse, such as reports, proposals, essays, memoirs, novels, and all of the other forms our writing can take. And here's what may come as a surprise. The paragraph as a form is every bit as artificial, every bit as unnatural, as are the most extreme examples of euphuistic balance in serial construction. The sentence has been an object of critical interrogation for a couple of thousand years, but the paragraph, as a codified unit of discourse, is a concept probably first introduced as late as 1795 by Lindley Murray in his English Grammar a textbook that was hugely influential in the 19th century, going through some 65 editions in England and America. But most of what we think of as the definition of and rules for the paragraph, we owe to one brilliant but eccentric Scottish polymath, Alexander Bain, who in his 1866 book, English Composition and Rhetoric, made up the rules for the paragraph we now generally treat as if Moses had brought them down from the mountain engraved in a second set of stone tablets only slightly less authoritative than the Ten Commandments. I'll have more to say about Alexander Bain shortly. For now, let me just list his prescriptions for a proper paragraph. According to Bain, the paragraph is the division of discourse next higher than the sentence, and it is a collection of sentences with unity of purpose, each paragraph handling and exhausting a distinct topic. He then offers six 
certain principles that govern the structure of the paragraph for all kinds of composition. Number one, the first requisite of the paragraph is that the bearing of each sentence upon what precedes shall be explicit and unmistakable. Number two, when several consecutive sentences iterate or illustrate the same idea, they should, as far as possible, be formed alike. This may be called the rule of parallel construction. Number three, the opening sentence, unless so constructed as to be obviously preparatory, is expected to indicate with prominence the subject of the paragraph. Number four, a paragraph should be consecutive or free from dislocation. Number five, the paragraph is understood to possess unity, which implies a definite purpose and forbids digressions and irrelevant matter. And number six, S in the sentence, so in the paragraph, a due proportion should obtain between principal and subordinate statements. Compare Bain's specifications with those offered by the Harbrace Handbook, 7th edition, some 106 years later, and you'll notice a remarkable similarity. The Harbrace Handbook defines a paragraph as a distinct unit of thought, usually a group of related sentences, though occasionally no more than one sentence in a written or a printed composition. Noting that the form of the paragraph distinctively signals itself with a first line that is indented, the handbook continues, the content of a unified paragraph deals with one central idea. Each sentence fits into a logical pattern of organization and is therefore carefully related to other sentences in the paragraph. So the Harbrace prescription for the paragraph is that it should be unified, coherent, adequately developed. A paragraph is said, to have, is said to have unity when each sentence contributes to the central thought. Any sentence that violates the unity of the paragraph should be deleted. In expository writing, the main idea of a paragraph is most often stated in the first sentence. However, the statement of the controlling idea, often called the topic sentence, may appear anywhere in the paragraph, for example, after an introductory transitional sentence or at the end of the paragraph. A paragraph is said to have coherence when the relationship between sentences is clear and when the transition from one sentence to the next is easy and natural. An adequate development in the paragraph results in part from the arrangement of sentences in the paragraph according to time order, space order, order of climax, or according to movement from particular to general, general to the particular, or from the familiar to the unfamiliar. What has happened here, and in almost every other writing text with a chapter or section devoted to the paragraph, is that Alexander Bain's six principles have been boiled down to three, unity, coherence, and emphasis, but his starting assumption that the paragraph was just the sentence writ large, its sentences, the equivalent of phrases and subordinate clauses in the sentence, remains one of the central assumptions underlying most contemporary theories of the paragraph. And Bain's belief that the paragraph developed the idea initially posited by what he called the opening sentence and what is known today as the topic sentence remains one of the, if not the, most dearly held assumptions about paragraphs. Only Bain got a lot of this wrong, and his errors have been mechanically, if not mindlessly, passed down to us as the received truths of paragraph theory. Let's start with his faith in the topic sentence as the indispensable sentence that presents the subject of the paragraph. In 1974, pioneering writing teacher and theorist Richard Braddock, after whom the Conference on College Composition and Communication is named one of its most important annual awards, decided to put two of Bain's assumptions to the test. 
Braddock put together a representative selection of essays from major magazines such as the Atlantic, Harper's, Saturday Review, and the New Yorker. And he set about looking for topic sentences in the paragraphs in his selection. He immediately ran into trouble. In the first place, when he was able, when he was able to identify a topic sentence by stretching Bain's idea to cover a number of variations, including the idea of a topic distributed over two sentences, or one implied by parts of several sentences, or one that could be inferred but was not actually present in the paragraph, he still could only find some semblance of a topic sentence in fewer than half of the paragraphs he examined. And in only 13% of the paragraphs did the topic sentence appear where promised at the start of the paragraph. Publishing his findings in a frequently cited article in the winter 1974 research in the teaching of English, Braddock concluded both, quote, the notion of what a topic sentence is is not at all clear, end of quote, and he concluded that the evidence simply, quote, did not support the claims of textbook writers about the frequency and location of topic sentences, end of quote. Possibly even more damaging to Bain's largely deductive pronouncements about paragraphs are reports by Arthur A. Stern of Teachers College at Columbia and Edgar H. Schuster, a writing teacher who taught for 40 years in venues ranging from secondary schools to the Graduate School of Education at Harvard, of experiments they conducted in which they had respondents try to figure out how pieces of writing had been originally divided into paragraphs. Stern conducted his experiments in the mid-1970s by asking English teachers to paragraph a 500-word passage with no paragraph indentation taken from Cleonth Brooks's and Robert Penn Warren's Fundamentals of Good Writing. This paragraphing exercise asked the teachers to decide how many paragraphs that 500-word block of prose should be divided into and where the paragraph breaks should be. Stern got responses suggesting the block should be divided into either two, three, four, or five paragraphs, with only five out of a hundred respondents paragraphing the piece, as had Brooks and Warren. Reasonably enough, this result led Stern to ask, if as the handbooks declare, a paragraph represents a distinct unit of thought. Why is it that we can't recognize a unit of thought when we see one? If every paragraph contains an identifiable topic sentence, then why don't all of us identify the same topic sentence? Much earlier, Herbert Reed reached much the same conclusion about the cherished but apparently mistaken notion that some form of logical unity binds the sentences of a paragraph in his English prose style as revised for the 1952 edition. He notes, it is nearer the truth to say that a writer seizes upon some particular aspect of his subject and holds that aspect in his mind until he has seen it in all profitable lights. This process may take two or it may take 20 paragraphs. There is no rule. And whatever unity may govern the paragraph, it is not the unity of the development of a single idea. Edgar H. Schuster has conducted a similar experiment handing out at a teacher's convention an unparagraphed United States Supreme Court order consisting of 38 sentences. He reports his findings in his wonderfully transgressive 2003 textbook, Breaking the Rules, Liberating Writers Through Innovative Grammar Instruction. Tellingly, each one of those 38 sentences was selected by at least one respondent as the appropriate beginning of a new paragraph. No one in his sample replicated the original paragraphing by the Supreme Court. What's more, 
When Schuster later tried the exercise himself for a second time, he found that his paragraphing choice did not agree with the first choices he had made, leading him to exclaim, I disagreed with myself. The point Schuster makes about the outcome of his experiment, however, is much more important than its clear support of the idea that paragraphing is a subjective rather than logical process, as Schuster asks us to think what those results really mean. That Supreme Court order said what it said and said it cohesively or incohesively, logically or illogically, regardless of whether it contained three, six, ten, or even no paragraphs. Since emphasis would be affected, it's likely that a five-paragraph version would be easier to read and would be preferred by most readers. But apart from emphases, it would be the same piece of work. My point is that most contemporary instruction concerning paragraphing is almost ridiculously normative and arbitrary rather than reflective of the myriad ways in which we actually write our paragraphs. Sure, follow the advice offered by Bain in 1866 or the echoes of his advice that persists in most writing guidebooks today, and you may well get a unified, coherent, and well-developed paragraph, and there's nothing wrong with that other than the fact that it will be an artificial structure that forces your writing, your style, into a box made long ago by one self-trained rhetorician at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland. And if you go looking for examples that will fit this prescriptive model, you're almost certain to find them since this model has been forced on writing students for nearly 150 years. But the odds are you won't find paragraphs by celebrated or even by just your favorite writers that fit this mold. However, having said that, I should mention one variation on the Bain paragraph you may want to add to the options open to you when you build your own paragraphs. Francis Christensen, whose theories of the cumulative sentence I champion so unreservedly, has also advanced a generative rhetoric of the paragraph about which I have more than a few reservations. Basically, Christensen openly takes Bain as his guide, particularly insofar as Bain saw the paragraph as a scaled-up analog of the sentence, each paragraph organized by a topic sentence. But Christensen adds the claim that, quote, there is a precise structural analogy not with just any sentence, but with the cumulative sentence, end of quote. He argues... The topic sentence of a paragraph is analogous to the base clause of such a sentence, and the supporting sentences of a paragraph are analogous to the added levels of the sentence. Christensen then claims that the four principles that guide his theory of the cumulative sentence, addition, direction of modification, levels of generality, and texture, apply equally well to constructing paragraphs and can be equally generative for the writer who needs guidance in developing an idea through sentences in a paragraph. While Christensen finds a number of paragraphs that do indeed seem to reflect the coordinate, subordinate, and mixed patterns of cumulative sentences, and while it is possible to write paragraphs by thinking of each of its sentences as analogous to either the base clause or modifying phrases of the cumulative sentence, this model is, like Bain's original prescription for the sentence, quite arbitrary and limiting. In focusing on the ways in which many writing texts offer subjective, inaccurate, and ultimately misleading norms for writing paragraphs, just as I previously suggested ways in which conventional received truths about writing sentences so often miss the mark, and in celebrating the maverick stylistic theories of scholars such as Richard Lanham or the marvelously maverick prose of a writer and scholar such as William Gass, I'm warming up to the pitch I'll make in the next lecture for a maverick philosophy of composition. Actually, it's not my pitch, but it's been made a number of times before, both in writing scholarship and in the compelling examples offered by writers we regularly celebrate, 
while somehow failing to notice that we celebrate their writing precisely for the kinds of things we have again and again been warned not to do in our own. The most famous articulation of such a maverick philosophy of composition was made back in 1976 by Winston Weathers in his essay, Grammars of Style, New Options in Composition, his famous argument for what he termed a grammar B to complement the traditional, hegemonic, highly regulated, and largely subjective grammar A offered in most writing classes and peddled as indisputable norm in most writing texts. The idea of grammar B deserves a lecture in its own right, and it is an idea to which I'll return. For now, I introduce the idea of grammar B only to leapfrog over it for a moment to suggest that we may now need to be turning our attention to the possibility, if not the emerging certainty, of a grammar C, with that C specifically invoking the new looks and capabilities of prose made possible by computers. Most of our writing textbooks, uh, or textbooks, discussions of prose style, and celebrations of the sentence assume that we are talking about words on a printed page, while more and more of our engagement with language is actually an increasingly interactive interface with pixelated words on a computer screen. In this way, the materiality of writing is undergoing far-reaching changes just as it has previously been changed by the invention of the printing press and then of the typewriter. In some ways that I will discuss in the next lecture, Winston Weathers' idea of grammar B presciently anticipates the new world of sentences on the screen and its identification of new shorter and more striking blocks of prose, which Weathers, after a suggestion made by Tom Wolfe, calls the crot, and in its discussion of double voice as a forerunner of the kind of meta-commentary available to contemporary writers and readers, through the simple device of the hypertext hotlink. More to the specific issue of what computers mean for contemporary prose style, building on Walter J. Ong's study of the move from oral to literary to secondary oral culture, J. David Bolter and Richard Lanham have considered what happens to language when it moves from page to screen. It was Father Ong who persuasively argued in his famous study, Orality and Literacy, the technologizing of the word, that writing was a technology, and that technologies are not mere exterior aids, but also interior transformations of consciousness, and never more than when they affect the word. Moreover, as Ong traced the human development from oral to literary culture, from speaking to writing, he also argued that human consciousness evolved and that writing in general and specific writing technologies in particular played crucial roles in consciousness raising. While Ong devoted little attention specifically to computers, he dismissed or defused some of the common criticisms lodged against the effects computers might have on consciousness and included them in the broad array of technologies that he saw as promoting a resurgence of many of the positive aspects of oral culture and what he saw as an age of secondary orality. Bolter and Lanham then picked up on Ong's theorizing of writing as a technology and applied it more directly to computers and computer writing. Jay Bolter brought unique credentials to his highly influential 1991 study, Writing, Writing Space, The Computer, Hypertext, and the History of Writing, as he was a classics professor who, had also, who also had a degree in computer science. Almost all subsequent studies of hypertext, hypermedia, and multimedia writing build on Bolter's pioneering work with hypertext theory, and with hypertext technology, as he was also one of the authors of Story Space, a hypertext authoring program that preceded the widespread development of HTML as the authoring language that underlay the features of the World Wide Web. Bolter's writing space largely theorizes hypertext, the ability to link any word in a foreground text so that it will take the reader to a background text, at the level of the book or at the level of literature rather than at the level of the sentence or paragraph. 
But a number of his speculations would seem to be obvious starting points for our thinking about what a grammar C might mean, even at the most basic levels of composition. Noting that electronic writing, such as we now take for granted on the web, develops networks rather than the linear progression of book pages, that computer screens favor the use of short, self-contained units of discourse, and that the fact that electronic networks would almost certainly be navigated differently by different readers, calling for a radically new understanding of what we mean when we refer to the unity of a text, Bolter also suggested that electronic writing resisted traditional forms of closure, since there were always further hypertext links that could be established, expanding connections without limit. Electronic writing will probably be aphoristic rather than periodic, he mused. Richard Lanham, whose authority as a rhetorician I've already repeatedly invoked, also brought an interesting background to his book, The Electronic Word, Democracy, Technology, and the Arts, since he was a recognized authority on classical rhetoric who welcomes the new technologies of electronic writing. Lanham views electronic textuality largely in terms of what he sees in it as a convergence of rhetorical values rather than with the logical values usually associated with computers, with the visual syntaxes of contemporary art. He sees print as a philosophic medium while the electronic text is a deeply rhetorical one, and this new rhetoric makes use both of the graphic and typographic versatility and innovation offered by the computer, shifting Bolter's focus on hypertext to a focus on multimedia writing. Print, he suggests, asks us to look through the words on the page to the ideas and objects they represent, while electronic text invites us to toggle back and forth between looking through the words on the screen and looking at those words and all the ways they can be made more interesting by the computer. As he puts it, the computer screen makes text into a painting, frames it in a new way, asks for a new act of attention, and smiles at the seriousness that the text calls forth from us.